Today we embark on study number 10 of our current series titled Embracing the Essentials of True Christianity. So far in this series on embracing the essentials of true Christianity, we've studied the scriptures together regarding knowing and believing the gospel, knowing and applying your Bible, beholding your God and his amazing attributes, responding to Jesus Christ and all his roles, Embracing your security in Christ, which is eternal. Embracing your identity in Christ as you were in Adam, but now you are in Christ. And then in our last two studies, we looked at understanding your riches in Christ. Those unsearchable, exceeding riches that we have by God's amazing grace. Now tonight we continue this series by highlighting the need to personally grasp and comprehend the three tenses of salvation, which is an essential foundational truth that you must grasp from the Word of God lest you be thoroughly confused, and so many are. How important is personally grasping what the Scriptures teach regarding the three tenses of salvation? In the endorsements of my book, Salvation in Three Time Zones, Pastor Mark Danielson writes, and I quote, Perhaps no doctrine is as essential to the daily experience of the believer as that of understanding the three tenses of salvation. When reading Bible passages, one must understand, is this something that God has completed in the past? Something God is accomplishing in the present? Or something God will bring about in the future? Nothing will ruin the daily life of a believer while destroying assurance and confidence more than a misunderstanding of this life truth. Theologians stumble, pastors procrastinate, and believers become bewildered because they fail to recognize these simple distinctions in the Bible. He goes on to say, ignorance is not bliss when it comes to the Christian life. Many of the books written on the Christian life resemble casseroles to me. They combine lots of ingredients, taste good, and go down easy, but one never really knows what is in them. As a consequence, those seeking biblical truth often miss the crosswork of Jesus Christ, or believers end up living in perpetual carnality because they fail to understand the basics of God's ongoing redemptive work in Christ. Well stated, Mark. Amen and amen. You know, as you think of the three tenses of salvation, which if you've been part of DBC for any period of time, you've heard many times. It is so important to understand, which we will develop tonight, that God's plan of salvation on a spiritual level is in three stages or three tenses or three phases. Stage one deals with salvation from the penalty of sin. Stage two deals with salvation from the power of sin. And stage three deals with salvation in the future from the very presence of sin. So if someone were to ask you, are you saved? If you understand the Bible, you could say, yes, I have been saved from the penalty of sin. I am being saved from the power of sin. And one day I will be saved from the very presence of sin. In fact, you might have noticed as we sang three songs before our message tonight, that each of the songs highlighted the tenses of salvation. The first song we sang was Amazing Grace, which, by the way, underscores all three tenses. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved. What tense is that? Past tense, a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Going back, first tense. Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. T'was grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. That's second tense. And third tense is when we've been there 10,000 years. Bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Third tense. Now the second song we sang tonight was called, Not I, But Christ. The honored, love exalted, not I, but Christ. 
Be seen, be known, be heard, not I, but Christ in every look and action. Not I, but Christ in every thought and word. All to be saved for myself, dear Lord. What tense is that? So we're talking about second tense salvation from the power of sin. All to be lost in thee, all that it may be, no more I, but Christ that lives in me. And then our song right before the message tonight was saved by grace. Someday the silver cord will break and I no more as now shall sing, shall sing future. But all the joy when I shall wake future within the palace of the king and I shall see future and face to face and tell the story saved by grace and I shall sing future and face to face and tell the story saved by grace. Do you understand and can you identify and discern the three tenses of salvation when you read and study your Bibles? Hopefully after tonight you will begin to do this if you can't do it already. Now let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we read in verse 15 these words. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now the King James Version said, Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And they translated spudazo there, or spudazo men, by the word study. The New King James says diligent. Now why did they translate it study? Because the context of this regard, revolves around rightly dividing the word of truth. God wants us to be diligent to study his word in a way that's approving to him, in which... We will not be ashamed when we give an account to him one day. And in doing so, we must learn to rightly divide what? The word of truth. It speaks of absolute truth found in the word of God. Now, the particular Greek word translated rightly dividing is an interesting word. It was used of a guide cutting a straight path. It was used of a priest slicing a sacrifice just right. It was used of a farmer cutting straight furrows. It was used of a builder cutting rocks that fit exactly in place. It was used of tent makers like Paul cutting each piece of cloth so it would just fit exactly where it's supposed to fit and the tent could fit together. And it's used here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, of the need to rightly divide or interpret accurately with the utmost precision the word of God so that the scriptures all fit together in a comprehensive whole. They're written that way, but if you do not study them carefully, instead of them fitting together, there'll be dissonance, disconnect, wrong interpretations, and utter confusion. And we'll seek by God's grace to rightly distinguish tonight this key concept called the three tenses of salvation. In fact, I've found over the years that when someone understands this biblical concept, their understanding of Scripture is greatly increased and things really start to make sense. On the contrary, when a person does not understand the three tenses of salvation, they misinterpret numerous verses and arrive at many false conclusions as to what the Bible is actually teaching, as they tend to mix up justification with sanctification and glorification. In fact, when it comes to the three tenses of salvation, like Mark Danielson, I am absolutely convinced that it is one, one of the keys to properly understanding the Word of God. You don't get this down you're going to get macaroni and spaghetti, or at least a casserole, out of many passages. 
and it won't make sense. So turn with me now to the book of Psalms, Psalm 7. Psalm 7. Now before we look at many specific verses and passages tonight, let's consider the big picture starting with the definition of salvation. When you see that word save or saved or salvation in the Bible, what does it mean? Well, the biblical words translated save, save, salvation, etc., they all carry the idea of deliverance, safety, rescue, preservation, release, victory. And that's, by the way, the way we use it in our culture as well. Now what is interesting is that the concept of salvation is found over 600 times in the Bible. No small concept. For as you begin to look at the word salvation or its cognates, you will see that, again, it's found over and over again in its various forms over 600 times in the Bible. But one thing is very clear. The scriptures repeatedly teach That salvation is from some object or state to some object or state. In fact, if you were asked, are you saved, a legitimate question would be, what salvation are you referring to? If you were drowning, to be saved would mean for you to be rescued from the water to safety in a boat or on shore. If you were dying, to be saved would mean for you to be preserved from death to ongoing life. If you were facing financial ruin, to be saved would mean for you to be delivered from poverty to ongoing monetary prosperity. If your marriage was saved, it would mean that it was delivered from the ruin of divorce and preserved to ongoing harmony. The scriptures repeatedly teach that salvation is from some object or state to another object or state. So what determines the actual or nuance of meaning in each case or passage? The answer is context, context, context. Kind of like real estate. What's the key to real estate? Location, location, location. What are the first three rules of Bible interpretation? Context, context, and context. You've got to look at who's writing, to who, when, what precedes it, what follows it. You have to put it in a context. But that is true in all of life when it comes to communication. Suppose your mate says, says to you, that's garbage. Would you know what he or she was referring to? Is he talking about trash to be collected? Is it talking about a TV show that you disagree with? Is it talking about an inaccurate <coughs> statement? What's garbage? Apart from the context, you would not know. And again, this is true in everyday conversations. You ever talk to someone who just picks up as if you, they assume you know the context, and you're saying, what in the world are you talking about? In written documents, why would you begin in the middle of the document and not know what precedes it and what follows it? And the same is true in studying your Bible. You've heard me jokingly use this illustration before you. You look up a verse in the Bible, I need a verse for the day, and you put your finger on it, it says, Judas went out and hung himself. And you think, I need another verse. So you go and put it again, go and do likewise. You know. And then you come up with another one, and whatever you do, do it quickly. And you say, man, this is not starting out well today. And, you know, all three of those verses are in the Bible, but when taken out of their context can be twisted to mean something the Bible does not teach. And we know from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, that the unlearned and unstable soul twist and torture the scriptures to their own destruction. And that is why it is important that we do exegesis and not do eisegesis. You see, the word eisegesis comes from the word ice, and it means into. This means the interpreter makes the scripture say what he wants it to say. They read into the Bible what they usually already believe, and thus their bias flavors their understanding. 
where exegesis means out from the Bible. In other words, the interpreter allows the scriptures to speak for himself. So you draw out from the Bible what it's saying regardless of what you believe. You know, a good example of eisegesis is in Genesis 1, verse 5, God called the light day and the darkness he called night, so the evening and the morning were the first day. And here's a guy that says, well, that must mean millions of years. Day can't mean a regular day. Well, why can't it? Well, it can't because I have a bias called evolution that I've already embraced, so therefore I want to make the Bible fit my bias instead of allowing science to be properly understood in light of what the scriptures do teach regarding origins. And that is why the exegete says, no, the word day, according to language and context, means a regular 24-hour day. And this is where humility comes in. This is where recognition of the authority of scripture come in. This is where being consistent in interpreting the Bible in a normal, grammatical, historical, contextual way comes in lest you twist the scripture any way you want, like a pretzel, in order to make it conform to way, the way you think it should be. Now, having explained the definition of salvation, let's now observe in scripture the two distinct forms of salvation. For in the Old Testament, the primary usage of salvation is predominantly a physical deliverance, from physical danger, one's physical enemies, one's physical troubles, or even physical death. On either a personal or national level. So the first thing we want to underscore is that when the Bible talks about salvation, in the Old Testament especially, but somewhat in the New as we'll see, there is, oftentimes is referring to some kind of deliverance some, from some kind of physical danger or enemies. In Genesis 45, verse 7, And God sent me, Joseph said, before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. Save him in what way? Physically. He later said to his brothers in Genesis 50, 20, But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about, as it is this day, to save what? Many people alive physically. Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Alive what? Physically. Deuteronomy 20, verse 4, For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight against you, for you against your enemies to save you. Save you from what? Your enemies, physically. Now you should be turned to Psalm 7. Let's see some references in Psalms where you can read it in your own Bibles. Psalm 7, verse 1. O Lord, my God, in you I put my trust. Save me from what? All those who persecute me and deliver me. Save me physically from all those who persecute me and deliver me physically. Look at Psalm 17. Psalm 17. And verse 7. Show your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand, O you who save those who trust in you. And, and what does he save them from? From those who rise up against them. Notice, save from those who rise up against them. This is speaking again of a physical salvation. Now go to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Love the sound of turning Bibles. Psalm 37 and verse 40. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from what? From the wicked. And save them because they trust in him. Notice they needed to trust in him for physical deliverance. From who? Deliver them from the 
wicked. Now go to Psalm 44. Psalm 44. In verse 6. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. Save me what? Physically. In other words, I'm trusting in the Lord. Yes, I may use a sword. Yes, I may use a bow. Yes, I may use a gun. Yes, I may use some means of protection. But my faith isn't there. It's really in you, Lord, though you use various means to provide that protection. Physical salvation again. Look at Psalm 59. Psalm 59. And verse 2. Deliver me from what? The workers of iniquity and save me from bloodthirsty men. We see the word deliver here. We see the word save. But from what? Workers of iniquity, from bloodthirsty men. Clearly, this is referring again, not from salvation from hell, or from the power of sin, or the presence of sin, but physically from those who endanger me. Now go to Psalm 138. Psalm 138. And find verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against what? The wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. Save me from what? The wrath of my enemies. Physical salvation. Now keep in mind that while this same emphasis on physical salvation, as repeatedly taught in the Old Testament, does not remain in the New Testament. The emphasis doesn't. The New Testament does still at times employ this usage of physical salvation in a few places. For example, in Matthew 8, verse 24 and 25, we read this. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he, Jesus, was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us. From what? We are perishing. Perishing physically. Thus save us physically in light of the storm that we're experiencing. In Matthew 27, 40, while on the cross, what did they say about him? You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, what? Physically, from death and from off the cross. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In Mark chapter 3, verse 4, then he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life physically or to kill life physically? But they kept silent. We also see, even in the book of Acts, when Paul was making his journey to Rome, and there was this tempest that arose in the light of the boat he was on. We read in Acts 27, 20, Now when... When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. Now keep in mind, Paul was already saved from hell. This isn't a spiritual salvation. That we would be saved physically was finally given up. Later in the account, Paul said to the centuria, 2731, and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved physically. Can you imagine someone say, what must I do to be saved? And you say, you've got to stay in the ship. If you don't understand that context, you would say, where's the boat, right? And in this context, there was a boat that they needed to remain in in order to be physically saved. We read later in the same passage, and the soldier's plan was to kill physically the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape with the centurion, wanting to save Paul physically, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And so we see again, while in the Old Testament, 
The dominant use of salvation is physical salvation from death, from danger, from your enemies and such. We see that that's also used in the New Testament, but it isn't the predominant use of the word salvation. And as I think of physical salvation, what are the two groupings that this kind of salvation involves? You must keep in mind, some passages in the Old Testament deal with individual physical salvation. The verses we are looking in Psalms with David dealt with that. But there are also a number of passages that deal with national physical salvation as it relates to the nation of Israel. And one of the things that you really need to understand when it comes to your Bible is that while all the Bible is for us, not all the Bible is directly written to us. And while there are principles that are transdispensational or permanent or true in any age or and or dispensation, we recognize that from Genesis chapter 12, basically, to John chapter 13, we are reading someone else's mail. In fact, here's my Bible. This is along with the concordance and the maps in the back. This section of my Bible is really all dealing with the nation of Israel. When it comes to the church, it's a much smaller section that comes into play. Why is that? Because God gave the Abraham a covenant in Genesis 12 to 12. On the, kind of on the uh, coattails of that was the land covenant, the seed covenant, the blessing that would come out of those, that Abrahamic covenant as well, the land Davidic and new covenants. And so this book is primarily a Jewish book about a Jewish Messiah who was going to come one day and set up a primarily Jewish kingdom on earth as promised in the Old Testament. What happened? He came in his first coming, offered himself king of the Jews, and they rejected him. Through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave, he offers spiritual salvation now to all who simply put their faith in him. And one day those promises made to Israel will be fulfilled, for they were not canceled. I mean, yes, they were, they were not canceled, just postponed. Well, God is presently building his church, which does not replace Israel, as Israel still has a future, but simply shifts by way of emphasis, as Christ said, I will build my church. So as we think of national salvation, Exodus 14.30 says, So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Deuteronomy 33, 29, Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. National deliverance. 1 Samuel 14, 23, So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to Beth Haven. Isaiah 45, 17, But Israel shall be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. When will that happen? In his days. Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. You see, these promises have never been fulfilled, and we're told in Romans 11, verse 26, that God has not canceled them, just postponed them, so all Israel will one day be saved as a nation. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And we know that in the latter half of the tribulation to come, Israel as a nation will turn to the rightful Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. They will realize they rejected him in his first coming. They will realize that he died for their sins and rose again. And through faith alone in him, they will be personally justified. And as a group, as a nation, they will be physically delivered from their enemies into the kingdom promise on the earth. And we've seen that in our study of the book of Revelation. And so keep in mind again that the Bible has a lot to say about physical salvation, either on a personal or national level. But the second form of salvation that we must be keenly aware of when we're studying the Bible is spiritual salvation. 
And in the New Testament, the predominant use of, of salvation has a spiritual salvation in view, especially in light of the fact that Jesus Christ came in his first coming to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, sometimes that word salvation is used in just kind of a generic, general way of speaking of the whole ball of wax, as it were. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19, 10. 1 Timothy 4, 9 and 10. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, but especially of those who believe. So there's a kind of this general sense. We read in John 3, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now we're talking about spiritual salvation. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved spiritually. He who believes in him, Christ, is not condemned. Instead, he's saved. Saved from what? In the context. Saved, again, from perishing. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, is salvation from hell really that simple? What must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your house. And by the way, embodied in that name, Lord Jesus Christ, is his person and work. That he's God who became a man who died for our sins and rose again. And why was that needed? Because again, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our sins had created, as it were, a barrier between God and man, a barrier that only Jesus Christ could remove and did when he died on the cross for our sins. So that... Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ said in John 10.9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Can you really know for sure that you've been saved and you have eternal life? I write these things to you. Believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have Eternal life. 1 John 5, 13. And that is why for the unbeliever, salvation is always in what tense? Future. Why is it future? Because they've never been saved. You can't say you have been saved because they haven't been. It's a gift that's offered but must be received. It's a gift that's paid for by the blood of Christ but must be personally accepted. It's a gift that's available to all but only received by those who put their faith in Christ alone. Thus, for the unbeliever, salvation is always future. And that's why back in Acts 16.31 again, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be Future tense, saved. Passive voice, God will save you. Indicative mood, that is a fact, that is a promise, that is a guarantee from God to you. Now this leads us to begin examining those three definitive tenses phases or stages regarding spiritual salvation that we must comprehend. So turn now in your Bibles with me to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 3. Now remember, Paul is writing to Titus. He is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's understood that he cannot save himself. He understands his works cannot save him. No ritual can save him. And he has chosen in the past to put his faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work. 
We read in Titus chapter 3, verse 3. For we ourselves were in the past also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. By the way, what else would you expect from the unsaved? And what a description of you and me before we were saved as well. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. What tense is the word saved? Well, right from the English, it's what tense? It's past tense. It doesn't say he is saving us, present tense. It's not he will save us, future tense. It's he saved us. It's certain. It's complete. It's done. It's finished. And it's past. What is it referring to? When we're talking about past tense salvation on a spiritual level, we're talking about salvation from the penalty of sin, namely hell. Again, this comes through simple childlike faith in Jesus Christ as he's presented in the gospel. Titus 3.5 makes it clear that this is a past, completed event for every believer in Christ. Now go with me to Ephesians chapter 2 and we'll see another passage that deals with this. Ephesians chapter 2, you're familiar with verses 8 and 9. Ephesians 2.8 for by grace you have been saved through faith. Now in the English, you have been saved is in what tense? Past tense again. Past tense. Now in the Greek, it's a little more complicated than that. It's called a perfect paraphrastic. Take that home and chew on it. What it means is in the past you were saved with the results continuing in the present you're saved. And let's slap on the present tense on top of that as well. Setting forth a salvation that is truly permanent. And how did you obtain this? By grace, through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let me comment on, and that is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. The word that does not refer to faith. Faith is not the gift of God. It, linguistically, from the Greek, they, everyone will tell you it can't refer to that. Now, Calvin is fudge here, even on their grammar oftentimes, because they want to make faith a gift, because they believe that man is depraved in the sense that he's not only separated from God, dead in trespasses and sin, but totally unable to even make a decision to put their faith in Christ. And therefore, the, many of them believe that you have to be regenerated, born again in order to believe. And yet we know from John 3, you have to believe to be born again. It's not live and look, it's look and live. Faith is not the gift. Salvation is the gift. And that salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. And this is referring to salvation from the penalty of sin or hell. Now, theologically, in the book of Romans, for example, this is called justification, in which we have been justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's a legal term, a courtroom term, in which God declares you righteous, not because you've earned it or deserved it, but because that righteousness has been given to you as a gift based upon the finished work of Christ, the moment you put your faith in him alone. And keep in mind that salvation from sin's penalty happens at a point of time, when you trust in Christ alone. There's no such thing as, I've always been saved. That's like saying, well, well when were you born? Well, I've always been born. And you ask, well, who let you out, right? No. You haven't always been born. You were born at a point in time. You're born again at a point in time. You haven't always been a Christian. There was a time when you were lost. There was a time when you heard the gospel. There was a time when you believed the gospel. And at that time, you were saved from the penalty of sin. 
The condition was by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. This is clear. And so when you're reading your Bible, you're asking yourself, who's writing to who? Are they already saved? And if they are, this is a description of salvation, past tense. Look at the words and look at the tenses that are used. Now go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, Timothy is a believer. He was saved probably through the ministry of Paul, though he was raised in a Jewish home in which his grandmother and mother both knew Scripture and taught him Scripture, and Paul came along and gave him the Gospel, and it all clipped. By the way, that is the value, parents, of instilling into your children the Word of God at a young age, having them memorize Scripture, learn Scripture, and so forth, because at some point along the way, hopefully it'll click, and they'll understand how to be saved. And then as a believer, they'll hopefully grow. Isn't it incredible how we make sure we teach them how to shoot a puck or make a basket or hit a ball? But do we teach them what they really need ultimately in life? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And you see, Timothy was a believer and he was involved in pastoral ministry there at Ephesus. And so for our purposes, we pick it up in chapter 4, verse 15. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress, your spiritual progress, may be evident to all. See, God wants you to make progress in your Christian life. As a result of being saved at a point in time, Awaiting the day you go home to be with the Lord. In the meantime, God wants you to make progress, not retrogress. He wants you to grow up, not merely grow old. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And taking in the Word of God is an integral part of learning to walk by faith, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we, we read in verse 16, Take heed to yourself, and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this you will save, there's our word, both yourself and those who hear you. You say, I'm confused. I thought he was already saved. Well, he was. This is salvation in a different context. This is the salvation in the Christian life. This isn't talking about salvation from the penalty of sin, but salvation from the power of sin, and then being used as a teacher of the word of God to encourage this in those who would hear him as well. Go with me. Or as we think of salvation from the power of sin, we're talking about being saved from yourself and from your old sin nature and from the world and the devil on a practical level so that as you walk by faith and are filled with the Spirit, you can glorify Jesus Christ and as you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So go with me to James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, I want to start actually in verse 18. In fact, let's, let's begin in verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Let's pause for a minute. Is he talking to believers or unbelievers? Believers, how do you know? Beloved brethren. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Now catch this, of his own will he brought us forth. The word brought us forth means we were born again. He brought us forth. When? In the past. How? By the word of truth. For what intent? That we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, believers who have been born again, when you're born again, you're part of the family of God, and thus an appropriate term for you as a brethren. Let every man be swift to hear, 
What? The word of God? Slow to speak? Slow to wrath? For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Let me pause for a minute. In this context, it's helpful to know a little background in which those whom James was writing to were believers who were, were getting a raw deal. They had been defrauded of wages that rightly should come to them in James chapter 5. And he's really teaching them in this book to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only and to respond right when you've been done wrong. And by the way, that's one of the real tests of where you're at spiritually. Will you respond right when you've been done wrong? And isn't it funny how it's always easier to see how someone wronged us than how we've wronged them? And he says this, if you let your wrath dictate policy when you've been done wrong, you're not going to fulfill the will of God in your life. You're not going to be delivered from the power of sin when that's the case. And thus he says in verse 21, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and those plans to get back or get even or do this or do that. And receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Now what's he talking about here? He's talking about their Christian life. Save their souls not from damnation, from, from damage. Not from the penalty of sin, but the power of sin. For if they walk after the flesh and live in carnality, they're going to take things into their own hands. They will ruin their testimony and they will bring upon themselves consequences due to their sin. And he wants to deliver them from that as part of the sanctification process. Now, sanctification technically is in three tenses as well. There's positional sanctification, there is progressive sanctification, and then there is perfect sanctification. But theologically, we use the word sanctification normally to refer to not being declared righteous like in justification, but to be made righteous in our Christian lives. The time factor is this involves a process of time while you walk by the Spirit. So you learn to walk by faith and you're walking by means of the Spirit. You're being delivered from the power of sin and you're spiritually progressing in your Christian life. The conditions are by God's grace through yielded and daily dependence on the Lord via the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be explaining about this in our future studies as we look at Romans 6, Romans 7, and Romans 8. Now go with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We've seen salvation from the penalty of sin by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone at a point in time. Salvation from the power of sin, which is the process of time when you yield and depend upon the Lord and walk by means of the Spirit. Now in Romans chapter 5, I want to call your attention to verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. What tense is that, by the way? having been justified, past tense, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Shall be saved is what tense? Future tense. Now there are some who, I believe, wrongly interpret this verse to say this is talking about second tense. The problem with that view is second tense guaranteed for believers. Do all believers live a life in which they are saved from the power of sin? No. Some live in carnality, some are taken home early, but we have divine discipline and so forth. And if you notice closely, this is not a subjunctive with a desire. This is an indicative as a guarantee. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies... We were in the past reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be, future tense, saved by his resurrected life. You see, this is talking about salvation from the presence of sin. 
which will ultimately culminate in heaven when we go to be with the Lord. In fact, while we're in Romans, go to Romans chapter 13 for a moment. In Romans chapter 13, verse 11, we see clearly a reference to a future kind of salvation for the believer. Verse 11, and do this in the present, knowing the time that now it's high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Our salvation is nearer. That means it's future, but it's, we're getting closer every day. This can't be referring to something in the past. It's clearly not referring to something in the present. It's clearly referring to something down the road in the future in which every day brings us closer to it. It's talking about salvation from the presence of sin. Theologically, we call this glorification. This, like justification, is going to happen at a point in time. When you die or you are raptured, Absent from the body is present with the Lord when you die. If you're raptured, you're going to see the Lord in the air and not experience death. The conditions for this is, again, by death or by rapture to experience salvation, third tense. And I can tell you this, the older I am and the more, again, I see everything moving, the more I want, I want the rapture to happen. Not just merely to escape but you know, frankly, wanting to escape is not a wrong reason. Didn't you get saved because you wanted to escape hell? Yeah. But it's not the only reason to want to leave. I mean, to go to be with our Lord, to see Him face to face, to worship in His presence, and so forth. Wow. And to think we deserve hell. And instead, He's given us heaven. But you can see, if you do not distinguish these three tenses, you're going to read a verse like, now our salvation is near, and you're going to say, I don't get it, I thought I was saved. You're going to read a verse like James 1.21, receive with meekness the engrafted word that is able to save your souls, and say, I thought I was born again, I don't get it. And you're going to either arrive at, you can lose your salvation, or you're going to arrive at, you've got to do more than simply believe. You're going to have to endure to the end. You're going to have to persevere. You're going to have to do something in order to be saved, stay saved, or prove you were. And so when people fail to recognize these three tenses, number one, they misinterpret many scriptures, and two, they have a lot of doctrinal confusion. I mean, they are screwed up. And they may be pastors, and they may be commentators. In fact, you know, I just happened yesterday to catch Warren Wiersbe on Back to the Bible. They brought him back, even though he's in retirement, they brought back his old messages. And frankly, I was so refreshed to hear him explain the difference between your standing and your state, and thus the three tenses of salvation. Which had, was... was taught over and over again by Bible teachers in the past, but can hardly ever be here today. In fact, those who teach Lordship Salvation don't even want to teach that because they confuse justification and sanctification. And a failure in sanctification means you were never justified and you won't be glorified. And they confuse the gospel. They confuse the word of God. They rob people of an absolute assurance of salvation. In fact, Dr. Rich McCarroll writes, and I quote, when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, there are some truths absolutely vital to understand because they form an undergirding to many other truths. This certainly applies to the three tenses of our spiritual salvation. From spiritual birth to maturity and on into eternity, it is crucial for believers to keep this truth in the forefront of their minds and at the foundation of their experiences. So true. Now, when I was writing my book on salvation in three time zones, it forced me to go back and look at verse after verse after verse that has the word saved in it. I knew a lot of them, but 
There were ones that I hadn't thought about. And then I began really scouring the New Testament to see passages that included all three in them, either by direct reference or by inference. And there are a number of passages. In fact, go with me now to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And I want you to find verse 11. And I want you to see how th all three tenses are referred to here. First tense, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared, it's an aorist indicative in the past, to all men. And salvation has become available to all men because of the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, he moves from all men to teaching us as believers. The word teaching is in the present tense. Teaching us, who have been saved from the penalty of sin, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live, it didn't say we will live, but we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. In our present Christian lives, day by day, this should be true of us. And we do that looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, in which third tense salvation will be enjoyed. Either by death, remember, or by rapture, which this is referring to. And so, as we look at this passage, we can see verse 11, verse tense, verse 12, Second tense, verse 13, looking for third tense. Now go with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And after Paul sets forth the condemnation of all men in chapters 3, or I should say chapter 1, 2, and part of 3, and then justification by faith in the second half of 3 and 4, he now begins to talk about the blessings of justification in chapter 5. Verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith. Now notice, having been justified is in what tense? Past tense. Salvation, phase 1. How was it? By faith. We have peace, present tense, right now. With God, how did we get that? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom, Jesus Christ also, we have access by faith. Now I put one and two here because the word access is in the perfect tense. It began in the past and it remains to this day that you have, since the day you were saved, an ongoing access by faith into this grace in which we stand, perfect tense as well. And we rejoice right now, but we rejoice in the hope, which is future, of the glory of God. And so again, we see here, we've got verse 1. Here we've got verse 2a and b. And then here we've got verse 2c. All three tenses indicated referenced, inferred at least, if not more, in this passage. Now go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. You're getting a workout tonight in your Bibles. This is good. If you're a newer believer, I remember those days. By the time I got to the passage, Pastor Radke was gone. It's really helpful if you get to know the books of the Bible in order. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and I want you to find verse 8. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. Speaking to these Thessalonian believers. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Guess what? Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. 
In other words, your testimony seems to precede us by the time we get to a city. Guess what? We don't have to tell them about you. They heard about it already. Verse 9, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you, now watch this, number one, you turn to God from idols. Number two, to serve the living and true God. And number three, to wait for a son from heaven. You're waiting now, but you're waiting for that which is going to happen in the future. His son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come, which is clearly future. So again, we see all three tenses of salvation indicated or inferred in one passage. Now go with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Now sometimes they're referred to, but they're not always in order in a passage. And we see that here in 1 John chapter 2 at the beginning of chapter 3. In chapter 2, verse 28... And now, little children, a term for believers, what does he say? Abide in him. Abiding is a second tense concept derived from John chapter 15. In fact, the more I study 1 John, the two main concepts communicated over and over again in the upper room discourse of John 13 through 17 is the necessity of believers abiding in him and loving one another. And 1 John is all about fellowship with God through abiding in him, evidenced by loving one another. Abiding in him that when he appears in the future, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And by the way, we may have confidence. Why? Because I've been walking with the Lord and letting my life count for him, and I'm not ashamed before him at his coming. Now, it doesn't say he's going to shame us. He won't. But when we know that we haven't fulfilled his will and we've been wasting our lives and whatever, there's a sense of shame that we bring upon ourselves, as it were. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. This is similar to James 2. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, verse 1, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. That was true in the past when we believe. It's still true today. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, which is in the future, we shall, future tense, be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself in the meantime, just as he is pure. First tense, third tense, which then motivates us for second tense, salvation. Now we saw in Romans 13, verse 11, and do this, second tense, knowing the time that now it's high time to wake out of sleep, for now our salvation, third tense, is nearer than when we first believed, first tense. So again, all three are mentioned, but not chronologically in order, one, two, and three. We see in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, these words. If then you were raised with Christ in the past, and it's true you are, first tense, seek now in the present those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind in the present on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? For you died in the past, and your life is hidden, perfect tense, in the past or remains in the present with Christ and God. And when in the future Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Again, all three being referred to here. Now go with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're just about done. 1 Peter chapter 1. And again, when you read Scripture with this understanding which is not something that's forced on Scripture, but we've drawn it right out of Scripture. It will greatly help you understand what you are reading. 
Now, Peter is writing to believers who were suffering persecution. And he wants to encourage them that they have a wonderful future to look forward to, though in the meantime they're experiencing suffering, but even then, God has a good purpose in it. We read in verse 3 these words, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now I want to point out, has begotten us again is in what tense? Past tense. To a living hope, and hope is always future. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And what does that living hope involve? <coughs> it involves a recognition that we have an inheritance waiting for us. An inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled, that does not fade away. And it is reserved in heaven for you who are kept, present tense, in the meantime, by the power of God. You see, your salvation and you are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, speaking of the future. In this, in this what? In this salvation? In this new birth? In this inheritance that came with that birth? You are greatly rejoicing in the meantime. You're going through trials right now. I'll tell you this. When you start to think in terms of what the Lord has done for you, when you start to think in terms of what you have to look forward to, you can greatly rejoice in your present suffering. Though now, for a little while, how long is a little while? Well, it could be this lifetime, which is short compared to eternity, which you have to take by faith and be living in light of eternity to look at that way. If need be, you have been grieved by various trials. But even then, that has a purpose that the genuineness, the refining of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found in the future when you give an account to the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, may be found and the Lord's going to give you praise and the Lord's going to give you honor and the Lord's going to give you glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice again all three tenses. I've been born again. I have a wonderful future to look forward to. In the meantime, I have trials going on in my life. But even then, has a good purpose to make me more like Christ and one day to reward me in eternity. Now we end tonight in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Now piggybacking, as it were, maybe, again, the sandwich approach, this is the first slice in chapter 1. Notice the last slice, as it were, there in, or the second slice in chapter 5, verse 10. Similar wording. But may the God of all grace, who called us in the past to his eternal glory in the future by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a while in the present, will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. It's all right there again. And when you understand the plan of God in three phases, three stages, three tenses, when you distinguish them, when you recognize this, these scriptures will come alive. You'll understand them in their right context. You'll put them in the right place. You will derive from them the truth you need. And you won't confuse and mix and match. And as a result, you'll be able to hear clearly the word and will of God found on the pages of Holy Scripture. For this is what God wants in your life. For again, as we recognize the truth, we realize justification happens at a point in time in which we then are positionally sanctified, but now God wants us to grow and to be saved from the power of sin and become more and more like Jesus Christ until the day in which we are actually glorified when our standing and our state truly finally match, which, by the way, will be in the other side, either by death or by rapture. 
Now, I said at the beginning, and I believe this fully, that understanding the three tenses of salvation is one of the real keys in understanding the scriptures. You know, I was reminded when I was at Bible college many years ago, I was visiting with a girl who was a senior at Bible college. She was about to graduate in a couple of months. We were sitting at lunch on a Sunday afternoon, and we started talking, and I drew out the three tenses of salvation and explained it to her, and she said, wow, that is really neat. I've never heard that before. What a shame. To go four years to Bible college and not even understand the three tenths of salvation. And that's why you need to understand it. By the way, could you draw it out? Could you explain it? Could you go to some passages? Or would you say, Get the, go to Sermon Audio and watch? <laughs> you know, if you're going to minister to people on a personal level, this is something you need to know. You could draw this. You could write this all out in the back of your Bible. And you can use, you know, Cliff's Notes and cheat that way. But it's very helpful to understand. Because what we're going to be looking at in our future studies are all based on these foundational concepts which we build and build and build upon. But if you're here tonight and you've never been saved, remember what we saw earlier, that for the unbeliever, all salvation is in what tense? Yeah, future tense. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It can happen today. It can happen tonight. If you're willing to put your faith in the Son of God who loved you, who died for your sins, who rose again to provide salvation outside of you and in spite of you through the work that He did on the cross for you. He is not looking for your filthy rags of works He's not looking for a church ritual. He's offering to you not a reward that you've earned, but a gift that you could never deserve, that he paid for through his shed blood and is received by simple childlike faith in him. Now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let's pray.